Okay, whoa. What time do we have? Oh, it's after 10. Woo. It's after 10 here. Can't see. We, we're going to get prayer books today. See, Doreen. We'll review Humash, but you really don't, don't. I think we pretty much went through the important parts of the Humash. Um, let's see if there's anything I left out. We went through trope, commentary. Yeah, and then the, the, the uh, articles in the back. That's really a maps. Okay. Yeah, not necessary. Let's see, where did we leave off here? Good morning. Good morning back there. Hi. <laughs> we'll get started in just a minute. We're getting, if you have at home, for our dear friends on Zoom, um, we're going to be looking at the Sidur today. Sorry, we're getting our unit on the prayer book. So if you have, great. Hi, hi, Claire. There she popped in there. Where, where are you home or are you uh, away from London? No, at home. Are you at home? home? I didn't recognize the backdrop. Uh, no, there's the French windows and a very great. Oh, style. they're new? Uh huh. And very Larry, I saw style. Larry and Sue. There they are. The yeah. tuxedo. He wears a tuxedo to my class. <laughs> really great, Larry. You there? Hello, Larry. Well, it's freezing cold here in Florida. <laughs> It's, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's about 66 <laughs> degrees now. It's going to warm up to 79. It's very cold here. But the mornings are nice and chilly. I like it. 
this text. Okay, tonight. we're going to start just a minute. We're getting see Doreen for everybody. Good. Uh, You'll get a sense as soon as you get there. Well, I didn't there. do that. I didn't do that either. Hmm. Okay, we should go over that a little bit. All right, I think let's begin and then we're going to get, of course, Susan and Adrian aren't, aren't here and they're just getting prayer books for Oh, Adrian's right here, right in front of me. That's great. No eyes. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. I'll need one myself. Otherwise, <laughs> I used to you know when I used to do it for them. A couple of congregants my, my, in Chicago. I used to do a stump the rabbi on page numbers of the prayer book so that people would throw out a prayer and I had the response on page 216 because <laughs> it was Purim, so it was just for fun. But just shows you what you know you memorize. But I don't I don't memorize all the page numbers yet in, in the uh, that was in the Sim Shalom, I think. Remember the old prayer book, which wasn't so terrible, by the way. Remember the old one? My, well, well, we'll get into prayer books. It's an interesting discussion. Do we like this one? Do we not like Lev Shalem? It's an interesting, the things I like about things I'm mm, 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 about it, but interesting question, discussion. Okay, uh, let's begin then. I, I just want to go back a little bit and finish some of the unit on the um, Chumash here. We, we pretty much went through the text that we use, the Eitz Chaim text. I wanted to show you some of the articles in the back, but I just hope you take advantage of this particular Chumash. There are different Chumashim, but this particular Chumash from the conservative movement, the Sorti movement, uh, has a wealth of uh, great articles in the back that, that often we uh, don't take the time to read. They're really good. In fact, you can have a class just on each of the uh, articles here. It's really terrific uh, text. But um, let me just make sure that I uh, covered everything. Oh, yeah. Well, we talked about the um, interesting question. Where did the public reading of the Torah come from? By the way, when we say Kriyat Torah, which is usually translated as the reading of the Torah, it really comes from the same, you know, there, there's two different meanings of the root kufresh aleph. It, it, likro means to read, but it also likro, like vayikra, means to proclaim. And um, almost everybody agrees that when we speak of kriyata Torah, it's really, the better translation would be the proclamation of the Torah, the public reading of the public proclamation of the Torah which is a reenactment of Sinai, a reenactment of Sinai. So it's not really reading the Torah, it's pronouncing the Torah. Eh, that's picky, but it's an interesting nuance. The only thing that we know about the read, public reading of the Torah is in Deuteronomy towards the end, uh, we learned that Moses proclaimed the uh, Torah, or part of the, we don't know what part, Maybe it was just the Ten Commandments during the holiday of Sukkot. That's it. We have no other indication of any public chanting, reading of the Torah until much, much later. My other class, we're going to get into Ezra tomorrow. Um, that's where the interesting story begins. So that was the start. And then Ezra, in the fifth century, uh, lengthened the uh, public uh, hearing of the Torah for the Shabbats and the holidays and the weekdays on the market days on Mondays and Thursdays. And that's where it developed and, of course, became a, a standard part. You, you can see the basis of that with the, you know, Moses coming down with the Ten Commandments and, and proclaiming the, uh, the Torah to the people. Um, I, I also mentioned the Haftarot, the prophetic portions, which the standard rule for the Haftarah is that there, and this goes back to the Second Temple period, so we're not changing 
what Haftarot, it's a really incredible system that the Haftarot were chosen because they, they um, uh, gave voice to a part of, or something in the Torah reading. Um, so uh, we read yesterday, I mean, Ran Shabbat about um, uh, Jacob and the, and the prophet Hosea speaks of Jacob fleeing from in, in his journey, which is exactly what happened in Vayetze. So you have the prophetic portion later, which is complementary to the Torah portion. And in each of our Haftarot uh, that we chant on Shabbat, there's, a, there's a, a nice little introduction by Dr. Michael Fishbane, who is a conservative rabbi, also a, uh, a professor at the University of Chicago, uh, who wrote the relationship of the Haftarot to the Torah portion. Now, the only time that changes is when. It, it's the, the connection between the portion and the Haftarah exists unless there's a holiday, then the holiday theme uh, uh, trumps the, uh, the Shabbat. For example, if uh, you're at Shabbat Hanukkah, which is coming up, you'll read the special, we will be reading the special Haftarah for Hanukkah rather than the portion, which is probably, I haven't looked, but probably me, Kate. So yes, Susan? Yeah, oh, so the question is, when the Rosh Chodesh, now that's also part of the days that, that take precedence over the regular Torah portion. So if it's Rosh Chodesh or Machar Rosh Chodesh, if the next day's Rosh Chodesh, there are special haftarot for those Shabbat, Shabbatot. Now that's an, someone could raise the question, but come on, Rabbi, Rosh Chodesh isn't what it used to be. It's not that important. Why does, I can understand during the week of Sukkot or in the week of Pesach, during Shavuot or whatever, when it's Shabbat, but why Rosh Chodesh? Come on, Rabbi. Or even Hanukkah, I can just understand. And the answer to that is, in the um, listing of the holidays in Pinchas, in the book of Numbers, Rosh Chodesh is mentioned along with the Shabbat and the holidays, which reminds us that the new month was like a holiday back in the days of the temple. It was a big celebration. Maybe that's because the calendar dependent on such a, uh, you know, a proclamation from the Sanhedrin, and a, it was a big to-do, but it, it appears, even though there's, there's nothing in the Torah that says you must abstain from your work on Rosh Chodesh, which is an interesting out, but it does appear that the Rosh Chodesh was a more, was a greater celebration, and on the, the tradition developed, and on those Shabbatot of Rosh Chodesh and Machar Chodesh, Rosh Chodesh, that you read, you chant the special Haftarot. Um, so that's generally the other, the other two times of the year that I can think of offhand when the Haftarah changes because of the time of the year are the three weeks before Tisha B'Av, when you don't read the regular Haftarah, the, it's pretty much linked not to the portion, but to the time of the year instead, those three weeks. And then the seven weeks before Rosh Hashanah, when there's no relationship between the Torah portion and the Haftarah, but there's a relationship between the Haftarah and the seven weeks of uh, optimism uh, before Rosh Hashanah. But other than those times, we link the prophetic portion with the, with the Torah portion. Uh, I just want to take also a little side here. And I noticed these notes I didn't go through here. Oh, I'll do this and then I'll go back to number three. Just my notes here. When is the Torah read? We all know, of course, it's read on Shabbat. It's read on all, during all the holidays. It's read during the weekday of the holidays, Cholomo Eid. It's read on Rosh Chodesh. It's read, not a Machar Chodesh would only be a Shabbat 
special thing. And it's read on Monday and Thursday mornings. And the reason why Monday and Thursday is those were the old market days. And, uh, and because of that, the Sanhedrin, the great Beit Din, the great court, would meet on Mondays and Thursdays when the people were in the thoroughfare. The idea was to make it a, a public uh, announcement. So the, the Torah is read. It's also read. It's never read in the evening except one time, Simcha Torah, which has its own rules. Uh, and it's also read at the Mincha service on Shabbat. And what, is, what is read during the week are the first sh three short aliyot. It's usually the, um, the uh, triple breakdown of the first major aliyah on Shabbat, um, usually 10 to 12 verses on Mondays and Thursdays. It's just the, like a, a preview of the coming Shabbat's uh, Torah portion. Uh, also, yes, Roberta. They read everything that was read on Shabbat, the entire Torah portion. And they read that on Mondays and Thursdays. Well, that's unusual because well, that was their decision. I don't, but in traditional synagogue, you would just read the opening verses of the next week's, next Shabbat's Torah portion. Uh, the comment made by Roberta here is that in her synagogue in White Plains, they would read the entire Torah portion on Monday and Thursday. They didn't split it between, well, that took a long time. That means people were there a long time on Monday and Thursday. See what a break you guys get? Nine, the services in White Plains on Shabbat morning between nine and one? Should, how many of you want to go back to four hour services? <laughs> how, did, how did I know that in advance? Don't worry, we're not going there. With a what? I, that makes a difference. And it also depends on the canner. Sometimes the canners like to repeat everything and the Kedusha takes 35 minutes and that kind of thing. I think we've, I, my personal view, and maybe we'll have a chance to talk about this. This is good feedback from me, but I think we found a nice balance between keeping our traditional service and not making it too long, especially with mass on the whole time. It, it, would, it would be unfair to have people... Um, sitting for too long, I, in my view. And I, I, I was only a little upset with myself because we ran about 10, 15 minutes longer than normal this last Shabbat. I like to finish 11th. I know it's ideal. A lot, a lot of it depends on the length of the Torah portion, the Haftarah, things like that, how long I speak. But I like, to, I like to finish in two hours. I think two hours is a nice goal. And I, th I think we're... Do you agree? All right, Elaine, thank you. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, you know, to show the gradation of the holidays, uh, when the Torah is read on Monday and Thursday uh, morning, three people are called to the Torah. That's it. You don't, not more than three. And four people are called the weekdays, the Cholam of Pesach, and Sukkot during the week of Hanukkah. So you see, it's a little bit upgrade from the, from the weekday. Rosh Chodesh, four. Five aliyot for the major holidays. Rosh Hashanah, forget Yom Kippur. Rosh Hashanah, Pesach, uh, Shavuot, and Sukkot. You'd have five aliyot. Rosh Hashanah, five. We're going to go to five next year. I know we have a tradition of reading seven, no matter what day it occurs. But I, I like the gradations here. 
I think there is a difference between Rosh Hashanah and Shabbat. And then num- and six Aliyot is only one day of the whole year, Yom Kippur, a six Aliyot. And Shabbat is at least seven. You could have 150 if you wanted to. Don't worry, we're not doing that. We're trying to keep it to seven. But you technically can add Aliyot on Shabbat. And I've been to services in Orthodox synagogues where sometimes they've had like 14 different people coming up. They like to honor this one and this one and this one and this one. And of course, you're there from nine o'clock in the morning till two o'clock in the afternoon. But generally, it's seven on Shabbat. Seven, six, five, four, three. That's it. And when you, when the, um, if you notice this with the division of the Torah readings, that we've done with the triennial, the general rule is you're supposed to finish the Torah reading on a positive note. Sometimes it's hard to do that because you're in the middle of, well, something that's more difficult. But generally you try to finish on a positive note and you have each aliyah has to have at least three verses read. If you don't read three verses, uh, and, and that's kind of a nice thing because it, it doesn't diminish from at least a critical mass of the uh, of the Torah reading and again finishing on a positive note that's why there's a little quirk sometimes I'm looking at Susan here because she knows like on Kitavo we have to repeat a remember that one we have to repeat a couple verses in order to keep with the principle of reading at least three aliyot and keeping on a positive and then there's one aliyah the Tochacha in Kitavo which is about 58 verses because it's so negative you can't stop it. And that's why that one's long. So sometimes you'll see in the reading, we'll have 12 verses for one Aliyah. I think we had this last Shabbat, one of the readings was longer. It's because the idea is to end the reading on, on as positive note as possible. So that, that's the thinking uh, behind all that. Okay, now uh, I just wanted to mention uh, about Aliyot coming to the Torah, which is uh, also part of our, our prayer service. Um, going back a little bit, who can lay? Of course, we know uh, that um, anyone can lay who's able to uh, read the text well, uh, chant well. The trope is great. It's wonderful. But it's not. if someone misses a trope, you don't have the gabai interfering, saying, oh, that's a pashta, not a, not a munach. Et nachta, you, d- you don't correct trope, but you should correct reading if it makes a difference in the meaning of the text only. So there's some words that are grammatically spelled a certain way. So if someone pronounces Eretz instead of Aretz, and it's supposed to be Aretz, you don't make a, you're not supposed to make a correction because it doesn't change the meaning of the text. That's kind of a stickler point. I'm looking at Susan because we have Gabai issues. Um, <laughs> now, last week, I think I brought up the situation of women and, and laning. Laning is, a, I guess, a Yiddish word for a reading of the, of the proclamation of the Torah. And it's, there's a very interesting Mishnah that says that um, uh, men should be the ones doing the reading of the Torah because of Bushab at Sibur, because of an embarrassment in the public. And it appears from most scholars that the reason that appears, and there's a commentary on that in the Jerusalem Talmud, which is not a text that was written very well or very uh, definitive, but it's there. And it speaks of the fact that the women were doing most of the Torah reading and the men were getting embarrassed by the fact that they weren't participating. And that's how our practice changed towards the men, but uh, we can understand now why that happened. And we can also, it helps us understand that how how absurd it is to keep women from participating, because if that's the reason, um, it's, there's no embarrassment to anybody. We should encourage men and women to be reading from the Torah so that we have a nice nice group. And we're very blessed here at our synagogue because we have so many people who are able to lay. And it really is not the norm. And uh, compliments here again to Susan and, 
and and how and Stan and how you both have uh, made sure that we have so many different participants uh, on a weekly basis. So the word Aliyah means it's like El Al, going above Aliyah means to rise up. La Alot means to ascend, to go up. Shir Hamalot, the steps of ascension that led to the Temple Mount, Aliyah. And there are only two times, well, actually three times, where the word Aliyah is used. Uh, one, one really doesn't apply much any longer, and that is making Aliyah to the uh, Beit HaMikdash, going up to the Temple Mount, like the Shir HaMalot. Shir Hamalo Peshuv Adonai Et Shiva. So the, the, the psalm was written because the musicians and the singers would line the steps. If you've ever been to the, to the ruins in Jerusalem, you see the steps leading up to the uh, entrance to the temple. Of course, that doesn't apply much to us any longer uh, because the temple doesn't exist. But uh, the other two times do. We make Aliyah if we move to Israel. If we move to the land of Israel, the state of Israel, that's called going up. You're going up. And I hate to tell you, if you leave Israel, it's called Yerida, going down. So up, it's like Jacob's ladder, up and down in holiness. And then the other time Aliyah is used, when we're called up, we say we call somebody up to ascend to the Torah. Now, what is the correct name? What is the correct way of taking an aliyah? It's very, very important. First of all, the gabai calling to the person to the Torah uh, calls the person up either by yamod harishon or ta'amod harishonam. Either the first one is called up, or he would say yamod hakohen. Or you ta'amod bata kohen, uh, may the kohen come first. We'll get to the division here. And the person is called up by their Hebrew name. Now, one of the things I'm trying to work on here is to see if our gabbais can read the Hebrew name rather than having the person come up. Uh, because we should have a list of all our members' Hebrew names. So we can just say when someone's coming for their aliyah, that we can, because the, the rule is, the technical rule is that when you're called up to the Torah, you should go up as quickly as possible. The body language symbolizes our desire to come to the Torah. So when we take time with the names, it's, I mean, it's okay, it's not the end of the world, but technically we should try to work for coming to the Torah as quickly as possible and not slowly. We're gonna see the exact opposite when we leave the Torah, we're supposed to descend as long as possible. That would be the time, Shabbat Shalom. And you know, the, the, when a, of course we have COVID now, so we have different rules going on. But in the old days, <laughs> someone would come to the Torah and they wouldn't leave right away. They would stay for the next Aliyah. And that's based upon what I'm sharing with you is that we ascend to the Torah as quickly as possible and we leave, we take a, our, our merry time to descend from the Torah. And think of the body language there. You know, it's the love of Torah. We don't just in and out, goodbye. We, we elongate that. So we come up to the Torah quickly. We're called by our Hebrew name come to the Torah, the person who is reading shows the person where the reading of the Torah begins. And then there's different traditions for that. Uh, we take our tzitzit, or if, if someone, if a woman's not wearing a talit, would take a sidur or the, uh, the, the Torah strap. And the person would show where the reading of the Torah would begin. We take our tzitzit, we touch that beginning word, we kiss the uh, tzitzit, and then we pronounce the blessing. There's different traditions. Some um, allow uh, uh, placing the tzitzit on the margins of where it's beginning. Sometimes there's a sensitivity to the, uh, to the print in the Torah. We don't want to smudge the print. So uh, we touch the margin or at the top. But the point is that we show our 
and I think I mentioned this with the Talit, we show our commitment to the covenant. You know, God made this agreement at Sinai with our people. What we're doing when we come to the Torah is saying, I'm at Sinai and I'm on the contract too, even though it happened 3,400 years ago. This is who I am. And this is the contract that I've signed with God, just like my people did at Sinai. You know, the Midrash says that we were all at Sinai. It's just that we're recycled and we come back at different times. Kind of a nice image. But that's the purpose of this. We're reaffirming the contract. We, re we, we pronounce the, uh, the first blessing, which speaks of the chosenness of the Jewish people, but that's a concept we'll get into in, in our other class when we dissect some of the ethics. The Torah is read by the reader. The old practice was that the person coming to the Torah did the reading of the Torah. So it's okay to assign that responsibility to someone else, but when you go to a lot of synagogues, uh, the person coming to the Torah will do the laning as well. I've usually, I, my witness is, is clear here. When I would come to the Torah in London, uh, even though I wasn't prepared and I was honored with an aliyah, I would usually do the reading even if I didn't prepare it. I'm able to do that, which is always a great honor. But um, if you're coming to the Torah and you feel comfortable reading the Torah, te technically, you have... Uh, precedence over the person who is assigned to do the reading. Often, I sometimes I've not done that. If if I was called for an aliyah and there was a, a adult or child who prepared for six months to do the laning, I would not say I'm going to do the reading. I don't care about your preparation. Only in cases when I could do that. So the reading is rather than the the uh, person reading would show where the reading ended. You're supposed to, when you're at the Torah, you're supposed to follow the Torah reading at the Torah. Of course, we can't do that right now because of our COVID restrictions. But when we return to normal, when you come to the Torah, you don't look at a, at a humash on the side. You're supposed to, to follow the Torah reading at the Torah. That's the Gabais are following in the text. The one who has the aliyah is following the reading by sight with the reader. Again, it's based upon the principle that technically you're supposed to do the laning. And so you're like reading, you're assigning the reader to do that reading for you, but you're reading the text. Not everybody does that, but that's some sharing with you all the fine points here, which are quite beautiful. And everything has meaning. Everything has a as a reason behind it. After the reading, we kiss the end of the uh, text. We remain on the bima until the next person's called up. And then we follow the reading in the uh, humash while the other person is called up. Um, good. I mentioned the hagba and the, and the uh, golel or golelet. The one who lifts the Torah at the end of the reading is the hagba one who lifts and golel means to wrap or to tie. And those, uh, believe it or not, those two honors were considered to be greater than the aliyot themselves. It's, it's not, um, oh, well, we'll just assign them lifting because it's there. No, it's a tremendous honor to lift the Torah. And there's, uh, we're supposed to show at least three columns of the Torah when we lift. And we're supposed to, now in, in, in Sephardic synagogues. And when I was in um, Florence about three years ago, Italy, in the Italian custom, uh, which was it's like between Sephardic, they have their own traditions. And they would lift the Torah before they started the Torah reading. And they would take the Torah around to the entire congregation. For everybody, so it was a very interesting tradition. The Sephardim also lift the Torah before the reading rather than after the reading. We're Ashkenazic Jews, and our practice has been to lift the Torah after the required Torah reading. But if you go to a synagogue and you see that there's, there's nothing wrong, these are different traditions that develop. But what 
unifies all these traditions is the idea that the Torah is for everyone there. It's not a hidden text. Now, that is a very important principle. Um, and not many people know that even the reading of the Bible was prohibited by the Catholic Church. Uh, the reading by lay people of the Bible was technically, and of course, people were not paying much attention, but technically uh, prohibited for lay Catholics to read the Bible until the 19th century. The idea was only the priest, only the special ones, you people just be quiet and listen to the hierarchy tell you what to do. You know, we Jews completely rebelled against that. Our kids, we know from the Geniza fragments, as the early fragments are from the 8th and ninth century, that our kids at five years old started studying the book of Leviticus. Exact opposite. The Torah is for public reading. It's for all the people. We want every, every one of us to be learned and to be literate. I always said that this is probably the ingredient that kept the Jewish people alive throughout all the Middle Ages. We were always needed, even by our enemies, because 95% of the non-Jewish world was illiterate, and almost 100% of the Jewish world was literate. And that kept, as we can document this in Spain, because we were between the Muslim and the Christian worlds, the same oh, in the Muslim fuck. world. So it's fascinating. Is that, oh, I thought I heard something there. So that's the idea behind the lifting of the Torah. Uh, we're supposed to show that uh, certainly the, the congregation, this idea of the revelation of Sinai is for everyone. And so that's how that tradition developed. Yes, Roberto. Oh, that's a good question, because there's different sizes. Um, I don't know what the poundage would be. 35 pounds? I, I don't know. Susan, would you be able to? The question is, how much does a Torah weigh, a safer Torah? Of course, it depends on the size. I've seen little tiny Torah scrolls that weigh almost nothing. And then there's huge ones that weigh a ton that we can't even use because they're so heavy. That's well, okay. Uh, Elaine's bringing up the point. Of course, it depends also where on the Torah reading you are because the, the, the poor people who are lifting the Torah at, in the summertime, as we get close to Rosh Hashanah, have to be very heavy on the, on the left arm because you're right. It adds to the complication. Now, as we're reading and we're moving into the middle of the Torah now, it's going to get easier and easier and easier for the Hagba. Uh, because we're getting towards, obviously, when we get Leviticus right in the middle, we have a balance between the right and the left. But um, there's no rule for the weight of a Torah. Of course, I didn't talk about the rules of writing the Torah, but, but I think we'll move on with that. Okay, and, and then, you know, I, I brought a note here. Um, there are some, not many any longer, thank God, uh, if you go to certain Orthodox synagogues, you'll see them bidding on the Aliyot. So some will say, who wants the Kohen Aliyah? And Max Cohen will get up and say, I put $250 and he'll be outbid till they sell the Aliyah for a thousand. Uh, it's kind of a crass custom developed. I don't know when that developed. Uh, I, I don't, uh, obviously we don't approve of that here in the synagogue. It's not a time for auctioning off, uh, making a contribution. But it is nice if someone has an aliyah to the Torah to make a contribution to the synagogue afterwards. There's nothing wrong with that. But this practice of, of auctioning off aliyot, you imagine what would happen on Yom Kippur if we say, okay, let's, let's, uh, let's auction off the first aliyah here. Um, so some people find that, of course, not acceptable and certainly not required. Um, good. Where did the practice of the Kohen and the Levi taking the first and the second Aliyot come from? Now, the, as we're going to be getting into the, our other class tomorrow, we know that the, uh, the poor 
priests and Levites, Kohanim and Levim, kind of lost their main role uh, after the destruction of the first temple. And then it became kind of corrupted in the second, but certainly finished completely by the year 70. There was really no role any longer for the Kohen or the Levi Levi because their main role was the ritual in the temple. So what remained afterwards? The rabbis, even though the rabbis replaced the Kohanim and the Nevi'im, and we'll get into that tomorrow, they wanted to maintain the tradition because it's so much a part of the Torah, the office of the Kohen and the Levi. So what they did is establish some parameters and said, listen, we're going to keep the honor of the Kohen and Levi as kind of a remembrance of the past. And we're going to call them first and second to the Torah to have kind of reminder of their important role in our history. Uh, and then the Kohanim um, took their role seriously, not the Levites as much, because the Levites served the Kohen, but the Kohen, um, uh, those who, who wanted to maintain their tradition would stay away, as it says in the Torah, they would stay away from the dead, they would not go to the cemetery, um, and they would, all the other role of the Kohen that continued was Duchanin. You know that term, Duchanin? Yes, Dana's Dr. Spock made that famous. A good Jewish guy, Leonard Nimoy. You know, it's really funny. William Shatner, Leonard Nimoy, who became these comic book uh, figures, are two Jewish boys who uh, you know, have very good Jewish backgrounds. <clears throat> William Shatner, I know, because he lived right down the block from me when I was growing up as a kid. So I'd see him a, a lot. He lived in that house. It was a dark brown house and a very nice man. Um, Leonard Nimoy was fluent in Yiddish. He was a very uh, well uh, knowledgeable uh, Jew. And of course, you know, Spock made that famous on Star Trek. Um, so, Duchening, the priestly blessing which we recite, Yevarechacha Adonai Vishparecha, it's, it's in the repetition of the Amidah. In, in what developed as, as a remembrance of the temple, which we're going to get to with the Sidur, in the Musaf services of, uh, of, of the holidays, that the priests, the, the Levites, would wash the feet and the hands of the Kohanim, and the Kohanim would come and uh, would bless the congregations on the Yantavs of Pesach and Shavuot and Sukkot. Now, what's interesting, when you are in Israel, you will see the duchening, the blessing of the Kohanim, um, on Shab every Shabbat as well in, um, in Israel, in the Orthodox synagogues. And in Jerusalem, they did the duchening every single day. So there was a hierarchy of where you're at. So you're outside of Israel, it's the holidays. In Israel, it's on Shabbat and the holidays. And if you're in Jerusalem, it's every single day. Um, most conservative synagogues have dispensed with the duchening. Not that there was anything formally, you know, it's interesting. I don't know how that all developed. First of all, it takes a long time. And I think I remember when I did this in Chicago on the holidays, we had problems with a lot of the Kohanim who didn't know the blessings. And it was a big kind of a mess. It wasn't dignified because they didn't know how to recite the blessings. I remember that issue came up. And anyway, the, the, uh, the tradition of the Duchnin is pretty much faded out of almost every uh, conservative. Center. I can't say all. I don't know what the practice is, but generally... It doesn't come up much any longer. So in, yeah, Adrian? That could be part of it. I, I remember 
when this, so Adrian was sharing, I always have to repeat for everybody that, that uh, part of the reason is that because of the, um, the class distinctions of going and non going, uh, there was obviously, there are a lot of different things. There were the practical reasons and the ideological reasons. And the, 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 the bottom line is it's really a relic. It's really to reenact the role of the Kohen at the temple Maybe the prayers are just enough, you know, that kind of thinking. And maybe it's not quite as important as it used to be. I've, I've you know, I have nothing really against it. It's kind of an awkward tradition where they get up, they recite the blessing and people look down because you're not supposed to see the, the radar coming from the laser beam coming from the Kohen. So it's a, it's a little bit strange because in general, to be a Kohen and Levi is a nice tradition. But it's not any, they really have, they have no real position any longer among our people. And I, I this has come up very often with me when um, in the Torah specifically prohibits a Kohen from marrying a convert and a divorcee. And I very often, I mean, a few times where a couple has come to see me, nice Jewish couple. It said that the uh, we we been members of the Orthodox synagogue, but um, my bride to be is is a divorcee, and I want to marry her, and they won't they won't marry us because I'm a kohen, which I you know in this day and age, come on, you know, give me a break. And I always tell people, by the way, I remember I had the situation. I I said to him, I won't mention any names. Um, the worst thing that could possibly, because they were sometimes in the Kohen, they're very nervous about giving up this family tradition. So all emotional. And I would say, you know, what's the worst thing that can possibly happen to you? I'm interested in building Jewish homes. You have a Jewish home. This, this is not an issue here for me. And the worst thing that will happen when the temple's rebuilt and they're going to call every Kohen around the world to come back to Jerusalem, and bring the sacrifices daily and on the Shabbat and the holidays, you won't be qualified. That's it. You won't be able to do it because your Kohen status has been, been tainted. But I don't think that's going to happen in our lifetime. And I would go about your business and um, not worry about that too much. And of course, now we're honoring Benot Kohen, the daughters of a Kohen, or Benot Levi with the first and second Aliyah. It's an honorary designation. I still think it's kind of nice remembering the past, but that's it. That's where it comes from. Okay, so I think we've done enough, and I certainly shared about the uh, trope. Okay, let's, let's go on. Yes, Dana. Oh, separate. Dana reminded me that I promised to talk about separate seating, and you're going to get the impression I'm avoiding the subject, and I don't want to avoid any subject. Um, separate seating, where does it come from? Very good question. The fact is, it's not required, period. It's all customary. The first reference we have to mixed. Uh, the prohibition of mixed seating is in the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud, the Tractate of Sukkot. And all it says there is that um, during the holiday of Sukkot, we know that the, the early practice was, they would, was the uh, Beta Shoeva. They would bring uh, water libations during the days of the temple. And they would, I don't know, it was the water celebration. And they would march around the temple. And they'd have these big parties every day of Sukkot. And apparently the men got out of hand. The men drank too much. You know, the alcohol was a problem back then. And in order to protect the women from these miserable men, which is a good principle, they said we're going to separate the men and the women during this libation celebration, the Hosha. We have the remnants of that with the Hoshanot and Sukkot when we parade around 
with our uh, lulav and etrog. That's the only reference we have to separation of seeding in the entire rabbinic period. Then we have the issue of archaeology, which doesn't enter too much into orthodox discussion, but it's a reality. If you wanted to know what the ancient practice of the Jews uh, was with regard to mixed seating or separate seating, we have a lot of evidence now. It's called ancient synagogues dating back to the third century before the common era. And that's the earliest we have, might even go, on, go back even further because we're, we have reference to houses of worship uh, even earlier than that in second Isaiah. So every single synagogue that they have unearthed in the Galilee, in uh, near Jericho, all those synagogues now from the eighth century, seventh century, way back into the, before the common era, there is no indication of any separate seating. All the synagogues have one uh, area in which everyone would gather together there, there's plenty of evidence of a, a niche where the Torah scrolls would be. We have that. We have indication of Ner Tamid in every synagogue. We have that. And, but you would, you would imagine that if there was separate seating, we would find some kind of indication that there was separate seating. And it doesn't exist. There is uh, what confuses the issue is that there was an area before the people went in for the worship at the temple. One of the areas was designated as Ratanashim, the uh, area for the women. But we know from Josephus, another rabbinic text, that even it was called the, even though it was called the area of the women, it was mixed, and it also wasn't the place where people were worshiping. It was like the um, the foyer where people were waiting to go in. So there is no evidence, absolutely none, for the period 2,000 years ago of any separate seating. None. It appears that the practice developed sometime in, in the... Um, we don't even have an indication of this in Saudi Arabia. I, I would guess sometime in the 11th, 12th, 13th century, where not only do we have then now evidence of separate seating in Jewish practice, we know that that was Muslim practice. And we know that that was Christian practice too, separate seating. I was in Spain. In almost all the medieval churches that they have found, they found that there were special separate places for men and women. If you're a historian looking at this evidence, what do you conclude? Obviously, Jews fit into a culture that developed in the Middle Ages of the separation of the sexes. Is there anything in the Talmud regarding that? You really hard to hang separation based upon the practice at Sukkot. There's no indication of any separate seating. And even at the time when Jews were separate, separating men and women in prayer, which is indicated then in the in the later codes. I'm not. I don't know about Maimonides, but certainly by the Shulchan Aruch, there's an evidence of a mechitza. Mechitza means half, a separation between men and women. But the even in the 16th century, there are no uh, requirements. It doesn't say you have to build a six foot wall. It doesn't say that women have to sit behind the pipes. It's all, all was dependent on the custom of the places. When, when, we, when I take people to the Altenoi Shul in Prague, and uh, clearly then there's indication that with separate seating, that synagogue was built. It's the oldest um, uh, synagogue in Europe. I believe that was built in the 12th century. And there was clearly separation of men and women. The women were behind like a 10 foot wall with little, oh, you were there with little, remember the little holes to, to see. There's no requirement for that. It's the way the mores developed. The, the separation of the gender was 
pro, uh, prolific in Muslim, Christian, and Jewish cultures. Welcome to the Middle Ages. But the genius of the rabbis, I would, I would say, is what? They never made that a requirement in, in halacha, Jewish law. Minhag, custom. So when you go to Israel, to Orthodox synagogues, you'll see separation of men and women. You still will. But you'll see all kinds of practices now. Sometimes you'll just see an aisle that separates the men and the women. Sometimes you'll see the uh, women sitting in the back or on the, in the balcony. But the conclusion will be, if you, if you go to all the synagogues in Israel, is that every synagogue has a different custom. And they're smart because that's all it is. It's customary. Reasons for it developed later. You know, you'll hear the Baba Misa. It's because men can't concentrate on their prayers if they're sitting next to a woman. That's, uh, it became that from Hasidic lore, you know, that somehow a woman is distracting in prayer. I think a lot of men are distracting in prayer. You ever been to an Orthodox synagogue when they start talking about the, the stock market or their real estate investments when you're trying to daven the Shema or the Amidah? I don't know. People can be distracting, but it has nothing to do with gender. So that's after the fact, Baba Misa. The fact is that it developed in a customary way that was prevalent in all the medieval societies and the, and the practice of separation got worse and worse and worse as we get into the later periods, and certainly in the shtibels that my, uh, and the, the uh, uh, shtetls that my grandparents lived in, there's no doubt that the women weren't educated and they sat way in the back, and that's just the way it was. I was blessed. My father's mother was very well educated in, in Hebrew and Mishnah. She taught, she taught Talmud, and she came from Pinsk in Poland, so we have little pockets where we see that the women were more educated than we can imagine. That's a whole separate study. So when it came to um, uh, devising uh, uh, synagogue architecture and, and policy, as I, met, I think I mentioned last week, the first synagogue I grew up in, B'nai David, was an Orthodox synagogue. Philip Schroit was the rabbi. We remained close throughout we'd go to israel together he really he was such a big man he was 350 pounds the nicest man in the world orthodox rabbi but so embracing in his synagogue where i grew up men and women sat together and they did it was an orthodox synagogue that was acceptable back then in the 50s the yeshiva university graduates as he was uh, almost all the orthodox synagogues had mixed seating it really the custom developed. Uh, I remember Rabbi Schwartz say to me after when he retired, he said, this is a new Orthodox rabbi. They're becoming very extreme and, and uh, just lost sight of the kind of uh, Judaism that he was trained, a very modern Orthodox rabbi. Um, when I, Claire is my witness, when we took our trip to Israel, there is a synagogue there that is uh, quite lively, called Shira Hadasha in Jerusalem. It's just a great place. It's an Orthodox synagogue. I, I, I like taking my people to um, a different experience. They can go to the conservative synagogue, but why, if you're in Israel, go to a service so much like the service that you're accustomed to? Try something different. So uh, we took our people to Shira Hadasha, and they have separate seating, like all the other synagogues, Men, women were on the left side, men on the right, and there was a light, a light curtain between. So you could, if you, if you really wanted to uh, look at the women, you could stare and, and see everything. It was a, a very, uh, very light uh, separation. And then what was unusual about this is that the women would read from the Torah along with the men. And I remember when we were there last time, a woman gave the, a, the uh, Devar Torah. Um, and then I think, a, I don't remember this. 
if a woman led part of the prayer too at the end. That I don't remember. But chanting of the Haftarot, Torah reading, I do remember, and the Devar Torah. So there was separation of men and women, but all the customs were changing quite dramatically. You would say that's a very liberal Orthodox synagogue, but unusual experience. But it just, but they were doing everything right because all of that is custom. And that's important for us to know. Don't ever think that you're an inferior creature because we have mixed seating here. It's just, that's to me, complete nonsense because that's all customary. We're doing it right, folks. I think it's good that we're all sitting together, my view. So as a historian, I think all this is very important. This is what I, I love to do. If, if there's a custom or tradition, I want to know where it came from. What does it say in the Torah? What does it say in, in, the, in rabbinic literature? How did it develop in the Middle Ages? Why did the custom develop? What were the practices of the, of the non-Jews around the Jews that influenced our traditions? And I think we should approach every subject in that way. I think it adds to our knowledge. So not many, not many of our people, unfortunately, know that. But that's where it comes from. It's customary. It's not required. There's, there's, there's nothing in the text that says a machitza separation has to be, even if you're doing it, has to be a wall or a, the synagogue in, in Prague is really something where women had virtually no, no, no say at all. So thank you, Dana, for that. I was able to respond. My throat gets parched if I don't drink. Okay, let's let's go. I have the prayer books here. I want to move on to the next subject, which is tefillah, prayer. And I'm going to start with this comment, which is really interesting, because for a lot of Jews, the one Jewish practice that they try to connect with Judaism is through prayer, coming to the synagogue and prayer. They might not keep Shabbat. They might not keep kosher. They might not worry about the holidays. They might not even study very much. But they come to the synagogue to pray. And yet, I can tell you that prayer is the most difficult ritual for the lay Jew of any rituals in Judaism. Prayer. Why is it so difficult? I mention a few things here. First of all, language. It's frustrating not knowing Hebrew. When I read translations and see what the text actually says, sometimes I want to scream and, and stop the service and say, you realize what it really says here? I did this on Shabbat with the uh, Torah portion, which is a lot of fun to do, to play with the words. But you see the nuances of the Hebrew language. You know, if, if someone were to come, let's say, from uh, Brazil, they speak Portuguese, and they, they don't know English well enough, and they want to they wanna read Shakespeare, you know very well that any Portuguese translation of Shakespeare is not going to be quite the same. That's just the nature of translations. You can't help it. Language is a very big barrier to uh, really getting the full understanding or, or emotions regarding prayer. Language. It's hard through an English translation if you don't understand the content of the words. Next, a lot of our prayers are written in very poetic fashion which makes even a translation difficult. I don't know about you. I was never a big poetry fan. I, I'm more of a uh, Maimonidean. I like linear, this written line by line. Poetry is beautiful. You have to think it's very creative. But to a lot of people, when they come to synagogue, they're reading poetry from the Psalms, from, you know, an ancient poetry to add to the problem is sometimes very difficult to pick up the metaphors and the meaning of a lot of our texts that were composed hundreds of years ago. 
So that's another problem. We have language, the poetic nature of the texts, the fact that many of the texts that we recite are very ancient, very old, and the style is very different than what we're accustomed to. Then another big factor with prayer that confounds people after they get frustrated because of the first three things that I mentioned is that the prayers can be very repetitive, or it seems to be if you just read the language, you know. Again, we're doing the Amidah. <laughs> Why do we keep reciting the Shema, you know, morning and evening, the whole text? Can't we just cut that out? So the repetitive nature of prayer is another issue to deal with. And we mentioned four-hour services. <laughs> it can be long. Uh, if we, you know, because why is it long? Because the prayer book and the way our services develop is like a layer system. We started with the Shema. We added the Amidah. Then we added this blessing and this blessing and this blessing and this poetry and this poetry and this lead in and this lead in. Uh, throughout all the centuries, Jews added to the prayer book. So it, it's like piles of centuries of work. So if you try to do everything, you're going to be there for four hours. So the question comes up, which I hope we'll be able to get to, is what can we cut? Why, can't, why do we have to do this and not that? But that's another issue, the length of, we, we talked about that with the Torah reading. If, you, if, you, if we read the entire Torah portion every week, Susan knows, yeah, I got to tack on a good 40, 40 minutes to the service at least, depending who's, who's reading. So length is an issue. We have a hard time cutting things out. Uh, and then, of course, you know, we can talk about our culture too. Our culture wants to have immediate gratification, which I, you know, if, if someone were to, I'm trying to compare this to, to want to learn to, to play the clarinet, and once and comes to the first lesson says, you know, teacher, I want to play the clarinet next week. <laughs> the teacher would say, you're going to need, you know, a good 50 lessons to even start playing. You're going to have to practice every day. You're going to have to get used to the nuances and the technique and all these different things that add to you can't just come one week. You can't just be a track, a marathon runner. And, and show up one day and I'm going to run 26 miles. It takes a long time to develop a marathon running. So you understand what I mean? So people come to the synagogue and they don't have a lot of background and they want immediate gratification. I'll let you fill in the blanks, but that's the reason why we have a lot of pressure now, for example, on at certain services and more of a tendency to want to be entertained rather than engaged in the, in the prayers, because it's easier to have an immediate gratification rather than go into the text. And then, you, you know, just off the cuff, too. Um, I think you all know I'm, um, I'm fairly well educated in music. So in my study of music, for example, we'll take the um, Beethoven Violin Concerto. And we could have uh, probably a semester of coursework just on the Beethoven violin concerto, how it was put together, the musical nuances, you know, how, how that fit into the violin playing, the history of it, da, 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 which adds to our understanding of the Beethoven violin uh, concerto there. But um, if you start cutting, let's say you have the Beethoven violin concerto, it takes about 45 minutes. And someone says, I want the abbreviated version. So as a teacher of the Beethoven Violin Concerto, you say, wait a minute, you're going to ruin the piece of music because it's all, it's like a composite. All the pieces fit together. And if you start taking this out and this out, you're really ruining the music. I'm just throwing that on the table as part of the complications with prayer. Because when you start taking things out, you have to be mindful of the overall package too. That's the problem with ab abbreviating. 
And, and do, people do react, by the way, they'll go to, and I don't want to label any, any movement, but people will go to a reform service and look very often will say, you know, I was there because I had to be there, but there was no this. And there was, they didn't, they only read 10 verses from the Torah and they, they cut, you imagine they cut the Amida out and they had rabbi. And so if you cut out too much, then it leaves the question of authenticity. So we're going to treat the session like a workshop here. I'm just dropping some of the complicated pieces, which affects all of us because we're all in this together. I, as a rabbi, am trying to um, do whatever we do here to make it uplifting, intellectually honest, though, at the same time. So it's a, it's a, it's a tough way to go. So individual attention and thought. I mentioned here, marathon without preparation. Um, and a lot of young people, frankly, they want more immediate gratification. They want to, I want to learn how to play the, the violin. I don't want to spend five years learning how to do that. It takes a long, I, I must have driven my parents crazy. I started playing the violin at four and a half. It must have been screeching my way. I was oblivious to the sounds I was making. But there's no other way of learning how to play the violin without putting in a good three years before you can make pleasant sounds. And a lot of our young people want instant gratification. You know, we're texting, we get immediate responses. Life has changed a lot. Attention spans are dwindling, I wrote here. So what do we, what do we come to pray to do? It's a very complicated process. You know, the, the story where you have Schwartz and Goldberg, if I can get the story right. Schwartz is an atheist, Goldberg is a believer. And, but Schwartz comes every Shabbat to sit next to Goldberg because they're good friends. And he, so they say, and someone says to Schwartz, you know, I know why Goldberg comes because he really believes in what he's doing. And, and Schwartz says, I come to be with Goldberg. I don't come to synagogue for any other purpose, which is a, also part of Jewish prayer. We come for minion. We come for friendship. We come to be with our fellow Jews. Uh, I remember Elliot Dorf wrote an article that there are some days that he's really not into prayer. You know, he, he's in, to be honest as a human being, we're not always in the same mindset. But he said what he what he he was always aware of that even though he might not be able to pray emotionally, his neighbor might need me. And so it's important for me to keep coming so that he or she will have that experience. The other thing that's lost in Jewish prayer, made a note here, is that we often forget what the highest form of Jewish prayer is, and that's study. Study is a form of worship. That's what we call a shul. A school is also a synagogue. You're here learning. I wish everybody in the congregation had this opportunity. It would be a lot easier for me as rabbi. But you're studying. You're praying. You might not realize it, but you are. Uh, and so that's kind of an introduction of the subject. Uh, what time do I have? Make sure we have time. So let's do a couple more things. We might not get to the seed or we'll have to do that next week. Um, first of all, what's interesting about Hello. Oh, okay. Must need batteries. I don't know what happened there. Um, the verb. It's very interesting. The verb to pray, the English word. If you look it up in the dictionary, if someone has a phone, you can look it up in the dictionary. We can get, get, let's get a, a quick definition so you don't have to listen to me. Any dictionary is good. Webster, whatever. To pray. What does to pray mean? How would it be defined? And Roberta says, you're looking up in the day, and I have a dic I have a thing here on my, which I use. So I, I I like having a dictionary here. Okay, Dana. Uh, 
A re, what was that? I didn't quite hear. A request. Request was a key word there. A expression of thanks. Well, that's kind of a modern because the Latin root of prayer means to beg, entreat, or ask for something. Ask for something. That's exactly. Yeah. Okay. So you get the idea. That's what, and it's, and I don't remember what the root is. It's based upon the Latin origins of the word to pray, which is a very, I'll say it, it's a very Christological way of looking at prayer to, to entreat. I, some of the uh, definitions use the word beg, to beg for something. That's not Jewish. The verb to pray in the Hebrew is a reflexive verb. That means it's an internal verb, as opposed to the verb to pray, which is external. It's, it's an external action. The word in the Hebrew is lehit palel, which comes from the root tefillin, tefillah, come from the same root, which it means judging. Lehit palel, means to judge oneself. Now that's a lot different than to ask and beg for something, to judge oneself. What I like about that is first, the first introduction of prayer means that when you're coming to pray, you are conversing with God, but you're doing it for yourself. You're not going to change God. That's the first mistake. You know what? If, if you come and say, God, uh, you know, I want a new bicycle, that, that is everything wrong from our understanding of prayer. But if you ask God to say, um, God, teach me the, uh, the attribute of, of not getting everything that I want and giving me the strength to understand that, that would be a Jewish response, lehit palel, an internal uh, practice to cajole God, to influence God, is not Jewish prayer. That's why a lot of people come up to me as we're going to look at the prayers, and there's God who made the seas, and God made the ocean, the mountains, and the rivers. And, and the question with all of those psalms that we recite is, why are we reciting those prayers? Does God really have to be told by you that he's the creator of mountains and oceans? Is it going to change God one iota if you don't recite those prayers? And the answer is, we need to, to recite that to remember our context within our existence, to reflect on the, on the awesomeness of creation, to put our lives in a perspective that we might not have had by not coming to synagogue. Do you understand that? You're, you're not reciting them for God. You know, there's the classic Midrash and why we keep kosher. And the Midrash raises that question. Are you keeping kosher to, to satisfy God? Does God really um, care whether you're separating milk and meat from each other? No, you're doing that to refine yourself, not to influence God. It's nothing to do with it. It's, it's a completely different mindset about religion, which is unique to Judaism, frankly. In Islam, it's submitting to God. In Christianity, it's, it's, it's also getting on your knees, which is the classic Catholic body language. In Judaism, we, we stand up and we converse for ourselves and with God. So tefillah is not magic. It's not changing the ways of the universe. We know that as we're going to look in the different prayers, we're not going to get to it uh, today. Yeah, just a few subjects I want to go through. There's different levels of, of tefillah. Tefillah is the Hebrew. I'm going to use that, that word because it's better than prayer. I've just explained to you why. So there's different kinds of prayers. The lowest form. And the newest form of Jewish prayer is individual petition. 90% of our prayers are written in the plural, minion. 
There are few meditations, like at the end of the Amidah, like the Tachanun uh, during the week are in the individual expression. But those prayers were written much later than the body of prayers, and they're not technically that required. There were Orthodox synagogues that completely eliminated Tachanun uh, to this day. Haskell Luxting wrote a whole dissertation why it's completely unnecessary. It's not part of the really obligatory part of prayer. So even those what they're called petitionary prayers from individuals are the lowest form. Not to say they're not nice, not to say that we can't have a place for them, but even the Amidah, which is done individually, silently, it's all written in the plural. We, 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 we. That is the classic form of Jewish prayer. Then the second level of Jewish prayer are the Psalms, like the Pesukah de Zimra that we've cut out a lot in our service. Psalms of praise of God. They're called, I think, a hexology. I think it's called, the fancy word is hexology. Praise of God. Like the Kaddish is a, is a, is a praise of God. But the reason for the praising of God is to have it as a reflection of our own place in the world. And that's the second form. Then there's um, a third form of Jewish prayer, which is I call the uh, historical awareness passages, like the in the Shema, the wearing of the tzitzit, the exodus from Egypt, uh, those parts of the prayer book that reflect on our past. And then there are parts of our prayers that articulate certain values, especially in the Amidah of healing the sick and uh, being responsible for the, for the poor, whatever. We see that in the Amidah, especially articulating values. And why do we articulate values? God doesn't need to hear that we're supposed to be kind and merciful and compassionate. We are supposed to be in need of that. And then, of course, the highest form of prayer is to study. Talmud Torah, Keneged Kulam, it says in the Mishnah, the study of Torah supersedes all other commandments. That's why when you hear someone say, well, well, Rabbi, why don't you just cancel your classes because uh, we have a, a meeting that we, have, we should do. That's the only time people can get together. And the re correct response is no, we don't cancel classes unless it's absolutely necessary for any other reason, because this is the highest form of prayer. It is the most sanctified form of prayer. What was it, uh, Chancellor Louis Finkelstein? I think I wrote his words somewhere here. Did I write it down? Classic thing is said when I, where I, when I pray, he wrote, he was the former chancellor of the seminary, brilliant scholar, rabbi, uh, etc. He said, when I, when I come to synagogue, I communicate, I speak to God for myself. But when I study, I hear God speaking to me. That's kind of a nice nuance of what we've just shared together. So study, the shul, the school. Um, and there are texts in the Siddur as well that allow us to study, especially in the morning part of the service. We're supposed to read a a uh, selection from the rabbinic passages. There's a whole section in our Siddur before the Baruch Hu on Shabbat of rabbinic texts on the observance of Shabbat. The idea there is that texts for study are also a part of the prayer. And, and that's why I try to do on Shabbat morning to make sure that we are learning and not just preached at. Because when we learn, we really feel, feel better. And let me uh, finish with, yeah, we're finishing up. The Siddur, the Siddur is the name of the prayer book, but Sefer Tefillah, book of, of Jewish prayer. The word Siddur means, it's like Seder, Siddur, same origin, means order. And in a Siddur, proper Siddur, there is an order of the different services. A very comprehensive Siddur will have the, all the Tefillah for Shabbat, for the holidays for the weekdays, morning, evening, afternoon. We'll have texts for study, might have the Torah readings in there, uh, have all kinds of things. I mean, there are all kinds of different Sidurim. 
translations are fine in in a, in the siddur. We know that the old the old siddurim that our ancestors had had Aramaic and uh, other language translations in in their siddurim. Uh, okay, I think we should call that because then next week I'm going to make a note to continue here. We're going to be talking about public versus private prayer, body language in prayer, facing Jerusalem, standing versus sitting, who can lead Jewish prayer. What? Well, I think we should have a little discussion about our Sidur, what it tries to do, what it fails to do, what is a machzor, why the three divisions in morning, evening, and afternoon, Sephardic prayer books and Ashkenazic prayer books. And then we're going to dissect, then we're going to get right into the text and have a good uh, overview of how the Sidur um, developed. I have his quote here, now I found it. When I pray, I speak to God. When I study, God speaks to me, Louis Finkelstein. All right, any, any questions before we finish up? Any, anything out there? I've, I haven't been able to turn around and see my dear friends in the back here. Hello, hello, anybody with a question? It's kind of good. I hope you're enjoying these uh, introductions. Very good. And um, so tomorrow more, yes, Roberta? If you're exactly right. During the Amidah, you're not supposed to interrupt somebody when they're praying. You're not supposed to interrupt yourself. You're not supposed to be moving at all and have kavana. It's a good term. Have complete attention on the, on the prayers that you're in the tefillah that you're reciting. Exactly right. There are other times in the service you can move around, but you're right. Not during the Amidah. And you're also not. Listen. It's as far as a hierarchy of Jewish prayer, the, the most important is the, the Torah reading, study, Sinai. Second would be the Shema. That's the oldest part of our service. Third would be the Amidah, the second oldest part of our service. And then everything else added, the Brachot and all the other things that we do were added later. So that's pretty good sketch. Okay, I think... Uh, We'll call it a morning until tomorrow morning. We're uh, shift gears. We're going to get into Ezra, Persia, the Greeks, interesting stuff. So thank you all. I hope you enjoyed. Hope you enjoyed back there. I enjoyed teaching you. <laughs> we did. See you all. See you, Larry. You can take.